Hi, welcome to Tessera's Nerf Room, and welcome to the Dirt Zone Review-a-thon! Five videos in a row. Today is Monday, then we've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. No breaks! Five videos for five days. This is gonna be insane. And all five of the blasters that I have chosen to review this week are pretty excitable blasters that a lot of people are really interested in, so hopefully this goes down really well. And I'm starting this review off with a blaster that I personally was more excited about than all the other ones, and I am the most interested in getting to, that being the Dart Zone Pro Mark 1.2. This blaster is insane, and it's got a legacy and a half. How good or bad is that legacy, and how good or bad is the actual blaster? Let's find out. <music> So the Pro Mark 1.2 is a 2022 release under the Dart Zone Pro series, which is, if you are unfamiliar, Dart Zone's kind of biggest, most obvious flagship line where they put out their best stuff that they put the most effort into. I'm putting air quotes on these because there have been lots of questionable releases in that lineup and a lot of questionable things going on with the entire Dart Zone Pro catalog in general. But all those things aside, this is still a pretty big deal of a blaster because it is a $130 purchase with dual rubberized grips and a rubberized stock that takes full lengths and half lengths and shoots 230 FPS which is kind of a really big deal. So how well does this thing do its job? Let's start with the design and figure that out. I absolutely love the way this blaster looks so much. I cannot even give you guys accurate detail as to how much I love the way this blaster looks with the stock, without the stock, with the mag release, without the mag release or the magwell adapter, with the iron sights or without the iron sights. This blaster looks freaking good. Look at this thing. It's a masterpiece of all of these little racing stripes, all of these little lines. Like, look at the shape of this magwell. This is so cool. The way that the grips line up with the rest of the blaster, the way that the stock integrates, all of the horizontal lines, the whole swept forwards and just fast, like it looks like an F1 race car. It looks fantastic. I love the way this blaster looks from both sides, obviously, because it's just plastic molding. So they've got all the details on both sides. The Dart Zone Pro 1.2 is one of the most, the most one, it's, it's just, da. It's one of the most beautiful blasters I've ever seen from any company, from Nerf, from Worker, from Dart Zone. This thing makes it into my top five favorite designs, hands down. I love the way this blaster looks. Whoever designed this blaster deserves a trophy. Well done. This thing's freaking magnificent. Let's talk about the ergonomics. This blaster has a main grip, a foregrip, and an adjustable, removable, foldable buffer tube stock that fits on an end strike attachment point. If this isn't the most tactical as hell attachment I've ever seen in my life, then I don't know what is, but we'll get more on this in just a second. The main grip, people had a few complaints with it. I love it. I love the main grip so, so much. It's everything good about the Worker Harrier's grip, the original End Strike grip, and the Elite style grip all rolled into one. It is smooth, rounded, and filleted. It's got finger troils that are rounded and provide a little bit of spacing between your fingers to give you a more balanced feel on the blaster. And it's fully rubberized all the way around with an easily removable rubber sleeve that extends past where the rubber sleeve ends up onto the top of the grip. This just being rubber that is built onto the grip itself so it can't really be removed. And oh my gosh, does it ever feel good. The dovetail right here, perfectly lines up with the trigger. The trigger is just, okay, we'll get to the trigger in just a moment. I'm getting a bit carried away. For the foregrip, it's exactly the same. And they provide the same style of look and the same style of feel for the foregrip as they do for the main grip. It is so comfortable and so ergonomically pleasing on the hand. I've got nothing to compare it to at all. It really is a magnificent main grip and foregrip setup with one slight issue. The issue being these rubberized sleeves. Yes, they're very comfortable, but they can do this. And they happen to do that quite a bit, especially if you hold the blaster too terribly tight. And it can be kind of a pain to get them realigned. It happens with the foregrip just as much as it happens with the main grip. Having the rubber sleeves misalign is the biggest, most obvious issue you're going to face when you're dealing with the ergonomic setup of the 1.2. 
With all that said though, I think it's honestly a worthy trade-off because of how comfortable these grips are. And for the stock that it comes with, one, it's the perfect length, two, it's rubberized, it feels so good to brace against your shoulder, the cheek wrist is super nice, and you will never ever use it. There's just too many moving parts. It would have worked if it was just a buffer tube that happened to fold and it was built onto the blaster, even without the folding feature. It probably would have worked just fine if it was a buffer tube, but Dart Zone went for the extra tactical points and not only made it a folding stock, but also made it compatible with end strike stocks. Right here, this was one of the first Dart Zone blasters that had an end strike stock attachment point. And while that is super cool because you can put on stuff like regulator stocks, it makes this stock very unstable, very, very unstable and unreliable and prone to breaking. Breaking off, snapping off, whatever. It's an issue. The back of it is adjustable, but the thing is this blaster is only designed to be used with this stock in its, in its most extended configuration because this little orange tab right here perfectly aligns with this little orange tab right here. So when you fold it in its most extended position, it will clip shut and you are able to just use the blaster without the stock. This is the intended usage of this stock, which is a really cool detail, but it only is cool if you meet all of those specific conditions, which rarely will be met because rarely you will be using this stock, especially if you have the high power spring in it. This blaster does come with two springs. You're probably not gonna be using the low power spring much and I will explain why later, but despite that, I really like this stock, and if I put this stock on a Strife, I would be a very happy man. So how does this blaster work? Well, it is a pump action mag fed springer. So you prime the blaster back like this, you take a full length or half length style magazine, load it in, push it forward, and then you can fire once. It does not have slam fire, then you can just do it again. Or, the blaster comes equipped with one of these magical nuggets, another mag adapter. This one says Pro on it. While most of them say Max on it, I like the fact that this one's gray and says Pro on it. You put that in and now it works with short darts. There we go. There is a humongous caveat to all of this. This is the most unstable blaster I've ever used when it comes to switching out magazines because there are three things about it that make it a chore. One, there is no skinny pusher, so you have to prime the blaster in order to take the mag out. Two, once the blaster is primed and pushed forwards, you cannot prime it again in order to adjust the mags at all. And three, there is a lock, so when you pull the trigger down, you are unable to pull the priming handle back at all. Which means that every single time you want to take a mag out or switch the mags out at all, you have to dry fire it dry firing a 230 FPS blaster without an air restrictor in it every single time. That sucks. And it does not feel good to have to do this. Every single time you have to cover the end and pull the trigger in order to prime it because there's no way to deprime it or put the blaster in a position where you can prime it back with your finger on the trigger and then slowly move the priming handle back forwards. That is a critical oversight. And one of the first things that I recommend everybody do when they get this blaster is opening up and at least removing the trigger lock so you are able to pull the trigger at any time with your leisure so that you are able to pull the trigger and pull the priming handle back so that you can at least pull it back, mag drop it, and then push it forward without having the blaster primed. Let's talk about the triggers and the smoothness of operation. First of all, the priming handle. Pulling this priming handle back is super, super pleasant. It is a very, very buttery prime back and forth. Putting the mag in, if it's a full length mag, is pretty nice. It is a rather loose mag well, so the mag does kind of wobble around a lot, but it works so I can't really complain. And it does mag drop with ease. The mag well is not flared and it is at a slightly weird angle, so if you are not used to mag loading this blaster, it might be a little bit difficult, but it's something that you can get used to. Pulling the priming handle forwards is also very smooth and it has a satisfying click when it hits the forward position. As for the trigger pull, it does have quite a bit of pull before you actually reach the trigger, but once you do get there, it is a unbelievably snappy, poppy, satisfying trigger pull. And it feels so good to do every single time. 
trigger pull. Now, before we get on to anything else, there is a very important thing I would like to explain to you guys. You remember how when the Nexus Pro came out, it had that little twisty knob thing that you could pull out and then you were able to switch the spring out by just adjusting one screw? This blaster has a very similar setup with a caveat that you have to deal with. It isn't that big of a deal, but I think it's definitely worth noting. When you remove the end strike stock attachment point right here with four screws, there is a fifth screw on the side. So that's five screws screws in total that you need to adjust before there is a twist knob that can be pulled out and the spring falls right out of the back of the blaster, just like the Nexus Pro did. If this wasn't here, if you decided to leave this off, it would just be one screw keeping the, the thing in place, which you could easily switch out at any point. Though, I really don't want to give up my stock attachment point, so I deal with the five screws. A quick demonstration of this process once all five screws are removed. You pop this off, and then you remove the fifth screw, which is only on this side. It is the screw right here. You take this knob and you twist it. It pops up, and then out comes the spring. And at this point, the spring that is in this blaster is a different spring that is specifically designed to bring this blaster's FPS down to 150. And at this point, I have to talk about the Prime Smoothness again, just briefly, so I can touch upon the fact that this is the lightest, most beautiful, most pleasant Prime I have ever seen, especially considering this blaster is shooting 150. It, it feels like an end strike blaster's prime. I can prime it with my pinky with absolutely no care or issue whatsoever. It's beautiful. Except for the part where you will only be enjoying this prime and this blaster with the 150 FPS spring if you are using these types of darts specifically. This blaster demonstrates a very simple principle that I've always really lived by, but never had any reason to touch upon up until this point. The principle in question being, it is incredibly easy to make a low-powered blaster shoot hard, but it is substantially more difficult to make a high-powered blaster shoot softer without sacrificing something. And that something is the accuracy and the consistency in performance. Let us compare the geometry of the bamboo dart that is included with the 1.2 with a basic ember dart that you could just buy from Walmart. Now this dart is specifically designed to make contact with the barrel at these two points, at the back and at the front. This allows it to have minimal surface area and contact with the barrel, but having the maximum weight and density. So that means that it travels further, it has better velocity and a lot more consistency and is easily able to overpower the brass barrel that the blaster comes with when you are using a lower powered spring. However, an ember dart like this has completely solid surface area going all the way down, which means the dart constantly makes contact with the brass barrel, and as such, performance is decreased when the spring does not deliver enough velocity to get the dart all the way through it and maintain the FPS that it was originally designed to do. What does any of this mean? To be simple, this dart right here could shoot at 150 FPS, but it could also shoot 60 FPS or 70 FPS or 90 FPS or 110 FPS or 120 FPS, or it could just not shoot at all. It could get stuck in the barrel, like what happened many, many times during my testing with multiple different types of darts using the smaller spring. This principle also carries over to full lengths, which with most types of full lengths didn't work in the blaster whatsoever. They shot all over the place. There were tons of squibs. There were tons of fishtail darts that just shot in every direction. And the biggest irony is that when I put a B car or a scar muzzle on the blaster, it actually made it worse. Can you imagine that? There's a reason for that though. This is the muzzle that is on the front of the blaster. And this is the muzzle that the blaster comes with. It is just a tube that fits right in here and it just pressure fits in place like any form of B-car scar would. But this barrel right here is specifically designed for this blaster because the attachment lug wobbles ever so slightly. It does not sit perfectly still, like on something like a Caliber, a Harrier, or even a Max Striker. This right here is a wobbly attachment, which means that if you put a B-car on this blaster, it will not always be facing perfectly straight. It'll have tiny slight variations in the direction that it is facing, like ever so slightly to the right or ever so slightly to the left. And this 
completely screws up accuracy. Darts will go wherever they want. They will not shoot where you're aiming. And that is a humongous problem with something like this, which is supposed to be a form of pump action sniper blaster. And with the B-car on the blaster, Darts farted out of the barrel, darts went out sideways, darts came out backwards in some places. It was insane testing this blaster. I can't believe how inconsistent it was. It was unusable, completely unusable. The only conditions this blaster were usable in is with the included darts, with the low powered spring or high powered spring, or if you were using full lengths, you had to use the high powered spring and you cannot have a B-car or SCAR muzzle on the front of it because it becomes completely unusable. Imagine that. Now, there is a fix that I can think of, but I'm not really sure if it'll work. Potentially, if you were to put a tiny piece of Teflon tape around the edge perimeter of this piece right here, you might be able to stabilize it to a point where it'll become a lot more usable and a lot more stable. I don't know if that'll work. That's just a theory. And you guys are welcome to try that, but just keep in mind, I have no idea if that'll work and you'll risk damaging your blaster. Now, before we get to the firing demo, and I promise that is coming up right after this segment, I want to address one more thing. The simplicity of cutting this blaster in half without having to deal with any form of screwdriver whatsoever. Even the worker Harrier, you had to get a key to put into the two pins to take out. Watch this. We have one little pin on the left. Screw that. We have one little pin on the right. If I can get a grip, there we go. We unscrew that. Both being thumb screws, so you don't have to worry about anything. Oh, there we go. And then simply put, you take this and you yank it out. And now the blaster is cut in half, just like that. Super easy. You have access to the barrel and the mechanism, and you have access to the rear pusher and the plunger. The simplicity of this means that you can enable and disable your blaster at will right on the spot, get whatever you need to do done, and put the blaster back together again in less than a minute. This is the only blaster I've ever seen to where you can completely open it up, maintenance the blaster, and close it back up in the middle of a nerf war. You honestly could do that because of how simple this blaster is to open up and deal with. I can totally imagine if something happens, if there's like a catastrophic malfunction, the worst kind of malfunction you can think of, being able to get behind cover, open this thing up, clear whatever is wrong, and put it back together before I have to get up and continue firing. There's no other blaster in my collection that I could think about being able to do that with, and that is a very big deal. Now, with all that said, let's see this beast fire. There will be two firing demos, one with the low-powered spring, alternating between half-lengths and full-lengths, and one with the full-powered spring, all again, alternating between half-lengths and full-lengths. Chili darts first. Waffle heads. Whoops. Jam. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. Where is it? Oh my god. Can I? Can I figure out where the damn dart is stuck in? Oh wow, it's it's really stuck there. Well, wow, this is an inconvenience. Problem solved. <laughs> Oh 
Oh my god. Come on. There's five left. Can we survive? It just jammed again. Huh? But it did it did it fire? No, it didn't. Oh my gosh. These darts are so bad. Now there's four. Oh, we're done. Accu strikes. Oh my god. Nope, you know what? We're we're done we're done with Accu Strikes. I am fixing this and then we're we're continuing. We're continuing forwards. This is impossible. Ram rod the dart. Back down. Suck. That all? No. Fit. There we go. Oh my god. Oh my god. Better not suck. Zero insanities. No. Of course. Whatever. Oh my gosh. Okay, screw it. We're moving on to half lengths. Give me this adapter. Nitro shots. Oh my god. Back in. The bamboos it came with. Worker darts. Ember darts. Did it? Did it seriously just jam? No, it didn't. I'm just stupid. Come on! Ah! Waffle heads first. Chili 
starts. Insanity darts. Hockey strikes. Busby, Accublast. I don't even know. I don't even know. Yo, we should be good now. Oh, crap. Okay. Onward. No. Are you kidding me? Locked up. Oh my god. <clears throat> what the hell is wrong with it? Ugh. Ugh, it's nasty. These darts do not work with this nugget. work wait I it might work 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 okay it worked can't wait for this magazine to be done strikes doing better than this oh my god that was horrific let's continue uh, what the hell's the thing called what the hell's the thing called bamboo dart you want to say I'm not accurate phase one foam I can aim Oh, 
what you have. Ow! 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 You should be good. You left. Just one. Worker darts. Worker darts. Of course, why would it just fire? Why would it do that? I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want it to do what it's supposed to do. This thing's gonna need an upgrade. Ugh. Enough of the jams. Just let me win. Just let me win. Just let me finish this. There we go. Okay. Oh my god! Continuing forwards, please. Thank you. Darts to finish it off. Ow! Too, too much pressure. Phew! So, what mod potential does the 1.2 have? The answer is yes. There is a lot of mod potential with this blaster. I really can't think of anything that you can't do besides potentially stabilizing this stupid front muzzle to make it take a B-car easier. But other than that, genuinely, this is a masterfully designed product that you can do whatever you want to with minimal effort. There is not much to botting this blaster. There's not much to opening it. There's not much to accessing the internals. There's not much to taking out the locks. There's not even anything to switching out the spring. This blaster is moddable, modular. Everything that you can think of, you probably do with this thing without any issues whatsoever. And because of that, in terms of moddability, that's why I bought this thing. I want to overhaul it. I want to make this thing even better than it actually is. So what do I think of this blaster in general? I think that- HOLD IT! There is one big thing that we've got to go over that has been the talking point of this blaster since release. The Dart Zone Pro Tournament Malfunction Crisis of 2022. This blaster was featured in the Dart Zone Foam Pro Tour, and it was the main Springer primary that was utilized throughout that event. And in one of the rounds, if you chose a Springer primary, you had to use this blaster as your primary. So what's the issue? Simple. It told people no when they asked it to do what it was designed to do. Jams like it was nobody's business. Malfunctions of the crack. So many problems to the point where everyone had to mod the blaster on scene to get it to work good enough to work in the game. And after the game, I don't really know what happened after that, but I know that it was a big deal and it made this blaster extremely controversial and infamous just because of that alone. And that's incredibly sad because I feel like if this blaster worked the way it's supposed to with no issues whatsoever out of the box, this could honestly be Dart Zone's best selling blaster. This thing is incredible. I love so many things about it, but there's also a few glaring issues right out of the box that prevent this from being one of the best blasters in my collection or even one of the best that they've created. The rubber moving around being one of the issues, the inability to prime the blaster with the trigger being held down, and the skinny pusher, the lack thereof, the issue with the B car and the scar on the front, the fact that you really can't use full lengths when it has the smaller spring in it, which makes this beautiful light prime completely obsolete. I do not know if Dart Zone did anything to fix these problems between the time that I got my blaster now and the Foam Pro Tour, but what I can say is that this blaster right here, despite all of its issues, 
I really, really like it a lot. It is comfortable, it's good looking, it's built well, it's got a, it's got the profile of a Tommy gun that you can put a stock on it. The stock is the most awesomely tactical stock I've ever seen in my entire life. It looks good on this blaster, it can fold, like it just looks well, it shoots well, it feels well, the prime is smooth, the performance is fun. It is so cool, I love the 1.2 way more than I really have any right to. But I can't really recommend that people look at this unless you're willing to give it a few upgrades. But if you are willing to sit down and give this blaster the attention that it needs and deserves, I think that the 1.2 could be an excellent offering for you right now. Especially because on Dart Zone's website right now, you can pick this puppy up for $60 half the price of the original price that people wanted for it, or the price that they wanted for it at least. And for 60 bucks, this is a really good value. It's the same price as the Max Striker 2.0. It's way more comfortable than that blaster. The Prime is way smoother and feels way more reliable, and it's just built better. There's more that you can do with it. I love this blaster. If you want to get it, I will link it in the description below. With all that said, thanks for watching. Bye.